Let us look to the head of the church in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank thee that thou didst love thy church with an everlasting love and in the fullness of time take upon thy divine self a human nature so as to be able to fulfill the law for her and to die on her behalf and to rise again for her justification. Help us, therefore, as we pursue this outline of the history of thy working in the church for which thou didst die. And grant us blessing as we especially examine the Reformation, which was a period of such extraordinary divine activity and for which we are so profoundly grateful to this day. Continue with us, we pray thee, that we, as we narrate these events and try to evaluate them, that we may understand correctly what the Spirit of God is saying to the church through the events of church history. That is our request in thy name, O Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Lecture 24, John Calvin, 1509 to 1564, and the Calvinists, 1. The three great reformers are usually listed as Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin. It should be remembered, however, that Calvin was second generation only being converted shortly before Zwingli's death and the greatest events of the Lutheran Reformation era. You see, I've already mentioned the fact that this uh, leadership that we do recognize, even though I'm pointing out the generational difference between Calvin and the other two, were fundamentally agreed biblical authority in the reform system and particularly the doctrine of predestination. Number two, according to Melanchthon, Calvin was, quote, the theologian of the Reformation, though as the monergist and predestinarian. I've already mentioned to you that Melanchthon, Luther's lieutenant, was the first writer of a theology in the Reformation era, his own loci communes, in 1521, but that was not a full-scale summa, as was Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion in 1536. At the same time that Melanchthon was fond of Calvin and paid that tribute to him as the theologian of the Reformation, there was this deep difference between the two friends. The points that I've already stressed, the fact that Calvin was a predestinarian. He was as thoroughly persuaded of it as was Twingley or Luther, and Melanchthon was anti-predestinarian for the be from the beginning, even though he didn't voice his opposition while Luther was still alive. And monergism is a point at which predestination touches the human life. We're corpses, according to Luther and according to Calvin, and only the Holy Spirit can bring us alive. So the regeneration is a work of God only. It's monergistic. We are corpses who have something happen to us. We are born again. We have nothing more to do with our second birth than we did with our first birth. It's something that happens to us while we're passive. That's clearly the teaching of John Calvin and just as clearly was opposed by Philip Melanchthon, but in spite of the fact that Calvin was a monergist and a strong predestinarian, Melanchthon could call him the theologian of the Reformation, and he could recognize, I think, that he was far more of a Lutheran than Melanchthon was a Lutheran. Number three. Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, the classic of the Reformation, was first published in 1536, the year of Erasmus's death, and I may say, incidentally, the year that uh, Tyndale was burned alive for translating the Bible into English and so on. But it was the year of Erasmus's death, a decade before Luther's, when Calvin himself was a veritable youth in mid-twenties. I was, uh, not long ago, a uh, question came up when I was addressing a uh, number of uh, young people on a college campus. A uh, question came up about original sin, and I said to them that uh, I probably am the only one here who would be capable of committing the unpardonable sin. They were all young people, uh, 
and I was teaching them about Christianity. Then I thought after saying that, that when Calvin showed more theological knowledge at 25 years of age than I do at nearly 75 years of age, I may have underestimated the prowess of those young people for gross uh, iniquity. But generally speaking, though, it takes a knowledge of the Bible of a deep and perverse sort to bring a, point, a person to the point where he will oppose Jesus Christ and actually attribute his works to the unholy spirit, the devil. But here was John Calvin at 26 years of age producing the greatest systematic theology of the Reformation, and many will consider it the greatest systematic theology of all time. Certainly its influence is probably the greatest of all time maybe next to Aquinas, but if less than Aquinas, certainly second place would have to go to this particular, at the same time that it was the work of a prodigious young genius, never the, it was also very brief at that time, and before he has finished all his revisions and additions and so on, for the standard edition of the Institutes in 1559, it's about four times larger. The Institutes as we know today, in other words, the commonly translated Institutes are much larger than that which appeared in 1536, but it's a fundamentally the same pattern. Calvin never underwent any drastic change in his view of the Bible and the systematic way in which the biblical doctrines hold together. Number four, Calvin was a Lutheran, or should we say that Luther was a Calvinist? I once gave a lecture entitled Martin Luther, the Great Calvinist, followed by Roger Nicole, John Calvin, the Great Lutheran. I think both of us would have agreed, Dr. Nicole of Gordon-Conwell and I would have agreed that both of them were Augustinian. As you heard me say earlier, when Luther discovered Augustine, as it were, in 1509, I think that was probably the beginning of the Luther Reformation, though we don't trace his conversion to that particular date. Probably the first time he really understood classic biblical Christianity and the significance of it dawned on him in later years. There is absolutely no question that Augustine is the greatest influence in the thinking of John Calvin. Quotations from his works abound in all four books of the Institutes, and both of them are classically defined as Augustinian, which is a standard orthodox form of the Christian religion. I mentioned to you when we were talking about Augustine, we should remember it here, that he had certain features which um, Calvin particularly removed, such as baptismal regeneration. Luther approximated to that particular doctrine, unfortunately, but the Reformed theologians rejected that out of hand as a massive error of the great uh, Augustine. But Augustine was so dug in on this principle, you remember, that he didn't shrink from saying that an unbaptized child would go to hell. Calvin, on the other hand, has almost the opposite problem. He writes in the Institutes as if every child of a believer is an elect person, if not an outright Christian. And the only reason he's kept from the Lord's Supper is that he doesn't discern the Lord's body. I'll be saying more about that later on, but this is just to call your attention to the fact that Calvin, as well as Luther and Zwingli, was profoundly Augustinian. But that doesn't mean they agreed with the great Bishop of Hippo in every detail. I corrected him fundamentally on this and some other points uh, as well, but there's no mistaking the basic thrust of their theology, and I'll take this opportunity to affirm once again that in my book, Augustine was probably the greatest theologian God has given the church since the Apostle Paul. Four, Calvin was a Lutheran, or should we say Luther was a Calvinist, and so on. Number five, that the two greatest leaders of the Reformation were at one in their message, apart from the sacraments, cannot be denied, however divergent those who came after them. 
I think I've developed that enough that you understand immediately what I'm saying, but let me in a sentence just say, Luther was a Calvinist, Calvin was a Lutheran, and if, those, uh, if that movement which began with those two great theologians had been faithfully adhered to by subsequent followers, apart from the Lord's Supper theory, there would have been a perfect unity to this day between Calvinists and Lutherans. Number six, Calvin was the son of a Roman Catholic secretary to the local bishop of Noyon in France. After an awakening traceable to Lutheranism in his native France, Calvin became a Protestant refuge G under Francis I, the king, to whom he dedicated his institutes, insisting it was not an innovation, but classic Christianity. This is, uh, in the opinion of uh, John Calvin, this was a very important uh, point. And for what it's worth, in the opinion of John Gerson, it was a very important point. And I want to call to your attention right now, Protestantism, according to John Calvin, is not only not a heresy, is not only not a heresy, but he's explaining in his dedication to the Roman Catholic king of France, Protestantism is not only a heresy, but it's the old classic Christianity. The heresy has come in some of the deviations before the 16th century that Calvin and others have had to uh, correct. One time the, some of the boys at Pittsburgh Seminary were coming home late uh, from some sort of a party and they saw that my light was still on in my office so they got their guitars out and said, I sing a little song which is sort of reminiscent of this historic episode. Give me that old time religion. Good enough for father, good enough for mother, good enough for me. Well, in a certain classical way, John Calvin was saying this is the old time religion and that it's Romanism which has deviated from that classic Christianity, not Protestantism. We look like the new kids in the block, but we're not. We actually are the ones who are faithful to the tradition of the church, and though he never convinced Francis I of that, he's convinced a multitude of other people that that is the case, that this is the continuation of early church and even the main line of the medieval church. And what it's departing from is the heretical developments, especially of the medieval period, but it is not an innovation. It's not an introduction to a new era and to a new religion. It is a perpetuation of the old and a correction of the errors of subsequent time, according to the author of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Number seven, after many vicissitudes, Calvin and his Reformation were established in Geneva by 1539, solidified in 1559. Calvin died triumphantly and at peace in 1564, just as the Roman Council of Trent was closing. During that period, he had met uh, Idolette de Bure, a widow of an Anabaptist, married her, and had been greatly helped by her, and when she died, he was very much broken up and said, I just plunged myself into work. Now, how he could have plunged himself into work more than he'd been doing all the time is hard to understand, but in his own estimate, the loss of his beloved wife there drove him to harder energies on behalf of the gospel than ever before. During this period, you've all heard of the episode of Servetus and the burning of uh, Servetus. Uh, you hear about the fact that John Calvin was in favor of the burning of Servetus and most moderns who believe in separation of church and state and the toleration of various uh, theological opinions and so on just see that as an act of grotesque horror that a Christian would actually advocate the burning of another Christian. But you ought to know, uh, keep in mind a little bit more of the circumstances there. Servetus was a person who had uh, left Geneva and had written very heretical books denying even the doctrine of the Trinity. 
He had been warned not to come back to Geneva. He had been apprehended by the Inquisition in Lyon, and had he not escaped imprisonment there, he would likely have been put to death by the Roman Inquisition. But he came, much to the surprise of everybody else, back to Geneva, where Calvin had warned him not to return, and he actually sat listening to John Calvin preaching, apparently hoping he wouldn't be detected, or maybe even wanting him to be detected. The point is that there was a great resistance to Calvin at Geneva from the very beginning. There were people who were called libertines, who not quite exactly the same as what we have in mind by that word uh, today, but nevertheless were people who were very much opposed to the rigorism, the ethical rigorism of uh, of John Calvin, and they had succeeded in driving him out of uh, Geneva at the beginning, and they tried strenuously after he returned to drive him out a second time and finally, and they saw in Servetus a real trial case. If Servetus could be reestablished and accepted, it would be in spite of John Calvin, who believed in the church state set up and believed that people uh, in Geneva as they were Christians and indeed to continue Christians, and if they gave up Christianity, it was understood that they would leave Geneva. By the way, let me remind you, the right of emigration was one of the great privileges of the Reformation, a great advance that was not taken for granted that when a person became anti-Christian and a heretic, he would be allowed to leave. But in Geneva, it was understood if people didn't share that conviction, they could leave, but they were not permitted to remain and they certainly weren't permitted to return after having left or been ejected. So when Servetus came back, he was in violation of Calvin's basic Christian doctrine, as I say, being a um, Unitarian or anti-Trinitarian and deviant from Reformed Orthodoxy along the line. And in addition to that, he was challenging the authorities to apprehend him and put him to death. And when he was detected there and apprehended, uh, Calvin certainly stood for his execution. That was the law of the land, and fellow reformers whom we advise confirmed the judgment of Calvin on this. And while some people think it's a kind of joke that the government of Geneva, when it uh, decided that Servetus was inexcusable and must be executed and sentenced him to death by slow fire, and Calvin interceded on behalf of an execution by rapid fire, that sounds like a joke to some people, but it was no joke to Servetus. The way one dies does make a difference, and it's a great deal more torturesome death to die by slow burning than by rapid burning, as anyone would actually reveal. It's a kind of indication in Calvin, he's not opposed to Servetus as such. He's not a sadist who gets his kicks out of seeing people suffer, and so on. This man was a threat to the church state in Geneva. If this kind of an attitude was permitted, that was the end of what John Knox was to call the greatest Christian city on the face of the earth. That was the ruin of Calvin's whole endeavor and so on. And so while it is absolutely true that Calvin was in favor of the execution of Servetus, it was under those conditions and for those reasons. And I think I can say this much, that if there is any justification, would you not all agree, if there is any justification for a liaison of church and state, a kind of theocratic society, then a person like Servetus would have to die if he insisted in returning to a city from which he had been allowed to uh, depart. I don't see how you can question that. The main objections people have today is because they tacitly assume that church-state liaisons are illegitimate, theocracy is a sin, and they, in addition to that, they forget this was a theocratic act, and the conclusion is that Calvin was just some sort of a hard-boiled fanatic who just liked to get even with people who tried to frustrate his endeavor, and any historian, no matter how opposed to Calvin's theology, will agree that that is an unfair judgment of the great Genevan. Number eight, virtually forced to settle in Geneva, he had almost his entire ministry there, constantly writing, teaching, preaching, and uh, corresponding and spreading the gospel all over 
a Europe. Charles Porterfield Crowell, a leading Lutheran theologian of the 19th century, wrote an important work called The Conservative Reformation, showing how Lutheranism had preserved more of the medieval heritage than Calvinism had. I don't think there's any question about the truth of that, but the book was big and uh, influential and significantly historical. It was opposed by Charles Hodge, uh, the great reformed theologian of uh, Porterfield Krauss' time, but in that connection it was very interesting uh, to show the sort of congeniality that obtained between Lutherans and some Calvinists and some Lutherans in the 19th century that Charles Porterfield Krauss, the author of the Conservative Reformation, which was critiqued by the great reform theologian of his time at Princeton, Krauss said about Hodge that next to having Hodge as a friend, the greatest benefit is to have him as an enemy. And what he meant by that is even when Hodge went on the attack and critiqued the work of Krauss and other Lutherans, he did it in such an affectionate manner and respectable manner and with obvious affection for the person he was criticizing that it was a privilege to have him as a critic, and there was a kind of camaraderie between these two men, even though Calvin was agreeing that the Lutheran Reformation was more conservative than the Calvinistic, but it ought not to have been, and that the Lutheran Reformation was too conservative as a matter of fact. And here we're noticing, once again, here's the Lutheran Reformation. It carries over many of the uh, practices and traditions of the early church, the Calvinistic, far less, it tends to break new ground, to adhere more closely to what the scripture allows and only what the scripture allows. On the other hand, we mentioned the Anabaptists who feel both of them are too conservative. I just mentioned this in passing to remind you of the fact that the Reformation in the 16th century and even in some of its purer preservations in later centuries did have this kind of divergence so that we'll be alert to the fact that people who are equally committed to the Bible as the Word of God and determined to have churches faithful to that doctrine nevertheless do deviate considerably on what they think is mandatory for faithful witness to Jesus Christ. I'm, um, I'll have to let that go as a kind of uh, brief uh, sketch of uh, the life of Calvin. It's hard for me it, uh, to let it go thus early, but I remind myself of a very uh, uh, a close friend of seminary days who was extremely brilliant, but just about as lazy as he was brilliant. And in a church history class, once he uh, answered the question, sketch a life of Jerome with a picture of Jerome as a baby and a middle-aged man and as an old man. I have a, and needless to say, he didn't survive in seminary long, but he, he had probably more brains than the faculty. He was a highly endowed person, but as I say, not at all inclined to use that amazing ability. Well, I, I plead guilty to being very sketchy at this point. Uh, also, I hope you'll forgive me, but I hope you get the basic feeling for John Calvin. He is the man, second generation uh, theologian here, building on the foundations of Martin Luther's, one really through Luther, indirectly through the Lutherans. And uh, I skipped this episode altogether. It was this fiery evangelist, Pharrell, who persuaded him that he ought to come to Geneva. His whole career is connected inseparably with Geneva, and he, uh, Geneva is considered the uh, foundation of the Reformed faith, as Rome is of the Roman Church, and London is of the um, Anglican Church, and so on, but that all came about through the persuasion, not of Calvin, but of this fiery uh, Pharrell, who when he discovered uh, Calvin passing through Geneva on one occasion, accosted him, and pointed his finger at him, and told him that he should be in Geneva, that God wanted him there. Pharrell had opened up the city, to reform, but he, Pharrell, was not able to build on that foundation. Pharrell knew uh, the 
institutes, and he knew that this John Calvin was the man who God intended to be the real and permanent reformer of uh, Geneva. And strangely enough, though Pharrell began to approximate Calvin's understanding of the Bible, Calvin did take that virtually as a word from God. And he stayed in Geneva and then was driven out in three years, goes to Strasbourg, and where he comes under the influence of Butzer, finds it'll let the Buer as his beloved wife and continues to write commentaries and preach to the refugees there. And doesn't Geneva invite him back again? Doesn't he say that's the last place on the face of the earth where I want to go? Doesn't Martin Butzer play the role of Pharrell at this particular time and say, Calvin, that's where you belong? So it's an interesting thing that the man who is famous for his inflexible resolution and determination, some people have said he's all will and so on, nevertheless had his fundamental career determined by the convictions of two other men, namely Pharrell and Butzer. But sketchy or not, I'm afraid I'm going to have to let the matter rest at that point.